The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, December 10th, 2017. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a pre recorded e Bible Fellowship's questions and answers time. This program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this pre recorded questions and answers time and say hello to Chris McCann. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to E Bible Fellowship Sunday afternoon question and answer program. During this time, we're going to open up the room to take your call, and each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by dialing the number, uh, which is 701-801-9989, and we'll be glad to take your call, and I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible, which is God's holy word. Now, at this time, we're going to take our first question. Let's go to the first person on the phone this afternoon. Hello, and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Question and Answer Program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, good afternoon, brother. I'm looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 11, and the explanation. And you can Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. And 12. And 12. And verse 12 is compatible to Ecclesiastes 1.18. We, we know about Ecclesiastes 118, um, but you can explain really verse 11 and 12 of uh, Ecclesiastes, please. All right, let's read Ecclesiastes 12, beginning in verse 11. The words of the wise are his goads, and his nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Well, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't worked through these verses. Um, so I can't say anything about verse 11 um, because I haven't really studied it at all. Now, in verse 12, it, it is um, true that the world is involved in the making of books. They're, they're constantly writing books. Uh, just go to any library in a big city and you just see thousands and thousands of books. And, and so mankind loves uh, to, to write books. And many of these books claim to have wisdom, um, philosophical wisdom or, or evolutionary wisdom. And, and, and so... Um, on one hand, we can see how this would apply to what men do in the world, uh, but it's the second part of that verse that says, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. That's interesting. This is also true in the natural realm with students. Anyone who, who has uh, taken a course in high school or a college semester, you're given many books, you're given uh, all kinds of chapters to read and study, and you have to diligently prepare for the test. And it is wearisome, and people who do that often get tired. But I think we can see the spiritual meaning of this as far as the Word of God, the Bible. When God commands the reader of the Bible search the scriptures, or to, what's it say in 2 Timothy 3.15? Um, yeah, I'm not sure where it is, but, but to study the show thyself approved unto God a workman that yes, needeth not to be shamed. 2 Timothy 2.20. 2.20? No, 2.15. 2.15. 2.15. Study, yeah, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So 
God uses the word workman, and um, he, he, he says in Hebrews, labor to enter into rest. And it seems to be a contradiction of terms because we know the rest has to do with salvation, rest in Christ, and yet he says labor. And, uh, of course, God made that statement in order to trap people who want to do some work. And, and what he really has in mind is laboring with our fingers. We're, we're turning pages. Uh, we're uh, reading Bible words. We're checking them out in concordances and looking them up and seeing how they're used elsewhere and this is labor um, it's being a workman in the Word of God and what's the first part of the person that gets tired even an elect child of God someone who loves the Bible because God saved them and gave them his spirit yet how often or how easily does an elect person go to the Bible and fully intending to study on Sunday like today, have all day long, and they sit down with their Bible, and after 15 minutes, their eyes start getting drowsy, and they their mind starts drifting. And you see, study is a weariness of the flesh. It's actually an excellent way to crucify our flesh or or to mortify our yeah. members is to study the Bible because the flesh resists the flesh would rather go get something to eat um, go for a walk to, or or be entertained or do this or do that other than anything anything is preferable other than sitting down with the Bible because the Bible is written on a spiritual level the Bible does not satisfy our flesh. That, that's for certain. It satisfies the soul that has become born again. It, it satisfies the spiritual need of a man and not our physical need. No, we, we're still unsaved in our body. And, and again, the last thing the body wants to do is to be forced uh, to to sit under Bible teaching, to to sit under Bible reading, and uh, this is why during the church age, when people would go to church, it, very difficult for many people, many men, they they couldn't sit still. They don't want to sit there, and they're not listening. It's like a waste of time to them because they're unsaved in both body and soul. It was a weariness. It, it was real, a real struggle for them to endure the hour um, spent in church, and 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 so we we can definitely see that this is true, and and so it would be good for us because God commands us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, and again that ties in with taking up our cross mortifying the flesh, putting it to death. There's no better way than forcing ourself and forcing that part of us that is unsaved to sit still, to teach ourself to sit still, to teach ourself to put in the time, to not allow ourselves after 10 or 15 minutes to drift away and and to end our study and and to be distracted by something else. No, we bring ourselves back. No, you're not going to sleep now. You're you're not tired. If you were watching a movie for two hours, you wouldn't be tired. So turn your attention back and start reading again, or turn on a Bible study and start listening and following in the Scripture. And in doing that, we, we are putting to practice what Christ tells us to do with our flesh. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon. 
question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris, and all the listeners. Um, good Sabbath to everybody. Um, comparing Ezra 3, 1 and 2, Ezra 3, 1 and 2, with Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Now, in your teachings today, and just from what we've known, that year, exactly after the 70 years, Cyrus comes in, and so they go to build it. And in Ezra 3, because from Ezra 1, it says as soon as Cyrus gave him the proclamation, told everybody that can do it, seven months later, they build an altar. So that's the altar. And I guess my question is, when you compare it to Daniel 8, 13, and 14, it says after the 2300 evening mornings, it, the sanctuary is cleansed. And we know that 2300 morning are... Um, 23 the evening mornings, so they're days, uh, you know, six years or six and a half, something like that. So are these two related? Ezra 3, 1 and 2 with Daniel 8, 13 and 14, because once they build the altar, they start sacrificing. And that year, even though it's just seven months later they build it, it's still, it's in the 71st year, that first year that Cyrus says go build it seven months later. I just want your thoughts. Thank you, Chris. And to everybody that partakes in getting this Sunday fellowship together. Thank you and God be with you all. Let's read from Ezra 3, beginning in verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Jazadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And you're right that this is taking place historically after um, the, the 70 years of um, desolation, the 70 years in which Babylon was overcoming the king, or pointing to the kingdom of Satan, overcoming the kingdom of God during the Great Tribulation. And that 70 years identifies with the full 23-year Great Tribulation period. At the completion, historically, of those 70 years, Cyrus, uh, also known as Darius, took the kingdom of Babylon, and he was king of the Medes of the Persians. And then Cyrus issued a proclamation that all the Jews who were taken captive into Babylon could return to their land. And, and so Ezra begins, Ezra chapter 1, with the Jews coming out of Babylon. And that would point to the end of the Great Tribulation period. Ezra and Nehemiah are very difficult books to fit into all the information we understand. You know, we we have a great deal of information that's harmonizing together concerning the Great Tribulation, that judgment began at the house of God, and then God, after that judgment was complete, the 23 full years of tribulation, he turns his attention to the kingdom of Satan, and, and he recompenses tribulation to them. We have really... Um, large amounts of scripture, more and more scripture is harmonizing with that conclusion and, and we're learning a great deal about Judgment Day. Ezra and Nehemiah are difficult books because, well especially Ezra, because it again is set at the end of the 70 years and is returning to the land of Judah to rebuild the temple and, of course, historically, these things had to happen. And some of what we find in that book is God just sort of painting a picture here and a picture there and continuing the historical narrative of the nation of Israel that must continue for hundreds of more years. But as far as comparing Ezra 3 with Daniel 8, let's take a look at Daniel 8, 13 and 14. And it says, 
that I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And, and the word cleansed uh, is a word that means um, justify. Or, or it, it's related to righteous, I believe. It, it, then shall the sanctuary be justified. And the 2300 evening mornings, we've understood, began on May 21, 1988, and continued until September 7, 1994, and that was the time in 1994 that the Jubilee period began. So the 2300 evening mornings fit in perfectly in that six year and almost four month period from 1988 until September 7th, 1994. And I think that's where it continues to remain that no, we don't we don't take it out of that spot. There's no scripture that's directing us to do that. And that was the first part of the Great Tribulation period. And and for that time, virtually no one was being saved in the world. God then officially ended the church age on September 7, 1994, when he began to evangelize the earth a second time and pour out the Holy Spirit a second time, and the sanctuary became cleansed or justified because beginning on that day in September uh, 1994, September 7th, all who became saved were saved outside of the church. That God was bringing in his elect, exclusively his elect. He was no longer bringing in wheat and tares, as he did to the earthly sanctuary or the earthly corporate church throughout the church age and 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 both wheat and tares grew together polluting really the sanctuary because you had unsaved unclean individuals within the church that was the outward representation of the kingdom of God on earth in order to cleanse the sanctuary, to justify it, make it righteous, God began sending forth the latter rain, and from the point of the initial sending forth until it completed, by the date of May 21, 2011, all brought in to the sanctuary, were brought into the, the eternal sanctuary. It's, it's sort of similar to Jerusalem above, and Jerusalem, which is now the corporate church, the eternal church and the corporate church. And this is why God says, when he, he says the, the sanctuary will be cleansed, it's why, for instance, we read in Zechariah 14, last verse, verse 21, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto Jehovah of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come, and take of them, and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of Jehovah of hosts. No more Canaanite. A Canaanite would represent a sinner in his sins or her sins. And in the church, there were Canaanites, we could say, during the church age. Canaanites and true Jews were saved and unsaved. But once God began to work outside of the church, he no longer was bringing in all the called and only few chosen, but he was bringing in exclusively his elect, which served to cleanse the sanctuary. So Daniel 8 is referring to those 2300 evening mornings, which led to the point of the cleansing, because from that point on for the second part of the Great Tribulation, God would only deal with the elect and no longer 
um, with unsaved individuals coming into his eternal house. Okay, well, thank you for sharing your question. And now let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. I've been looking at the two passages that uh, speak of when the Lord comes and knocks that his people open to him. And I have uh, four verses in Luke 2 and four verses in Revelation 9. Is that too many verses to read? No, that, that's that's fine. Let's uh, okay. start with Luke Here 2. they come. In Luke 12, verses 35, 36, 37, and then jump to verse 44. Luke 12, 35. 6 let and 7. Uh -huh. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily, I say unto you, they shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And then verse 44, 44. Of a truth, I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. And the verses you're comparing would be in Revelation chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Okay, Revelation 3, beginning in verse 18, says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see, as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And the way I was looking at this is that we know John uh, 10 says specifically that Christ is the door and that his knocking, uh, that always comes out as a rapping, but it's sort of uh, defined in Revelation 3 when he says, hear my voice. So the word of God has people that hear the voice. And then um, my premise was, that when he returns from the wedding, I went back to Matthew 22, when the king goes into the wedding and he finds a man that's not dressed in the appropriate garment. And in, in my Revelation passage, it talks about you must be uh, wearing the uh, raiment and that thou may be clothed and not ashamed of your nakedness. Never thought about that, Matthew 22. Maybe the man was naked, I guess. If he wasn't in the wedding garment, he was naked before the eyes of God, and that this passage that uh, is open to him is actually when God opens the scripture to us, because even if you're saved or unsaved, unless God opens your ears to hear his voice, his spiritual understanding of his word, you, you can't hear it. And if he's returning from the wedding, it would be the point in time where he kicked the man out that didn't have the raiment, and now he has all his bride, and they're all in their beautiful white raiment, just like uh, Revelation 19 talks about. And at that time, you've said so many times, when the, the people of God come with the word of God, that God always says it's as though God was coming and feeding them and serving them just as the beautiful feet of the kind people that uh, study and share the word of God with us. And then both these passages would parallel each other it is it is not man getting the faith and then exercising the faith to be saved or man having the gift of salvation and he has to open the gift. It would be God opening the word of God to his people at the final end. Uh, that's now. 
any anyway, what do you think of my study? Did I do okay? Well, yeah, I think I think that's correct. Um, as far as the return from the wedding in Luke 12, the wedding is laid out in Revelation 19. Uh, and also, it's a good tie-in with Matthew 22, with the um, the wedding feast and and the king coming in to inspect the guests. That's Judgment Day, and we know it's Judgment Day. Let me read there in Matthew 22:11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and the wedding garment would be the righteousness of Christ. Um, for the bride, it's uh, for all God's people, it's fine linen, clean and white. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth is taking place during this time period of Judgment Day. Uh, whenever we look up weeping and gnashing of teeth, it identifies with what was previously thought or understood to be hell. Um, theologians of the past have long taught that the weeping and gnashing of teeth is when the unsaved are cast into hell, and of course they're they're uh, afflicted and and uh, just tormented in the flame, and so they weep and gnash their teeth forever and ever. But we've been corrected by the Bible. Hell is not a place of eternal torment. Hell is just a grave. And God has brought the conditions of the grave to the earth, uh, to the whole world at this time. So the world is in the situation of hell, in the spiritual condition of hell, and weeping and gnashing of teeth is going on in these days after the tribulation. And, and so since uh, this identifies the marriage as a time, where God is judging as this person was cast out and into outer darkness. In Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb, a time of judgment very clearly. Therefore, to return from the wedding, and it is the word return. It's not going to the wedding. Um, let me read that again in Luke 12. In verse 36, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. So God is uh, really stressing here, which is a, a very important thing for his people to do in the day of judgment, which is to wait on the Lord faithfully. And, and here that's in view. Ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. You see, the time of waiting is during the wedding feast, during the wedding uh, when the guests are being inspected, when the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place. Then you have to wait. And we could say since May 21, 2011, since Judgment Day began, the marriage supper of the Lamb has been underway. It's been going on, and we are waiting on the Lord to finish the things that he has to take care of during this marriage ceremony, during the marriage feast, and so forth. Then he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. And... Um, you're right, this is like uh, the virgins it, in Matthew 25. Five wise virgins, after hearing the cry, the bridegroom cometh, were brought in to the, um, what, what does it say there, into the chamber? Uh, Matthew 25, 
verse 10, it says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. You see, the shut door, the bridegroom came, judgment day. Those two things are often in view with judgment day. The coming of Christ, as Christ is the bridegroom, is joined with the shut door. But notice that all of the wise virgins first entered in, then the door shut. God saves all the elect, then he shuts the door. All eight souls and animals enter the ark, Jehovah shut him in. Um, Lot is pulled back into the house. Jehovah, in the form of those two men, shuts the door on the rest. God shuts the door after safely securing his people through salvation. And then they go with him to the marriage. Now, Luke 12 speaks of uh, waiting until the Lord returns from the marriage, and, and the marriage is the working out of Judgment Day, but as we could find uh, numerous Bible verses to show, the saints judge the world with him. Christ comes with ten thousands of his saints. The, uh, know ye not that the saints will judge the world. Therefore, he goes into the marriage, we go into the marriage with him, because the marriage is the time of judgment, and God is judging the unsaved people of the world. Now, once the marriage supper completes, the inspection of the guest is finished, and, and everything necessary to be accomplished has been accomplished, then it's as though the bridegroom returns from the wedding to meet the bride all the elect who have been kept in a safe chamber like the five wise virgins and then it's as though there's a consummation at that point there there is the coming together of the Lord Jesus and all his people the entry into the new home in which the marriage the eternal marriage relationship will play out which is in the new heaven and new earth forever and ever he will never leave nor forsake us forevermore. He cannot put us away. It's an eternal marriage for all eternity future. And, and so the, these things fit and they harmonize with all the other information we've learned from the Bible that God is carrying out uh, an ongoing judgment process, a prolonged period of time, and it, once it's completed, then uh, he'll, he'll complete everything for this world and turn his attention to his people. And, and so, yes, I think you, you have those ideas together very well. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now let's go to our next caller. Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon question and answer program please go ahead with your call my question is in our day how can we tell if God is still with a minister now now before you answer I know part of the answer you're going to give me is that a true teacher uh, uses the Bible alone in its entirety and he compares scripture with scripture but because of the availability of doctrine on the internet and maybe on tapes or whatever you know what I'm saying it's so available that somebody can pose somebody can pose as a true minister and so what I want to know is in, in our day is there another way of telling if somebody if God is truly with a minister well uh, that's a good question you know, even the word minister, minister just means to serve. But we sort of associate it with a pastor, with the pastor who operated in the churches. And there was nothing wrong with that. That, that was 
their role, that was the task that God assigned pastors and elders during the church age, was feed the congregation spiritually to teach truth to those who entered into the churches and congregations. But we're living at the time of the end of the church age, and God has ended his relationship with the corporate church. Therefore, we can know this, and it's a, actually a great help. It's a tremendous assistance for people like yourself and, and this question. How can I know in a world of two billion professed Christians, and uh, this was especially a problem during the church age when there were so many denominations, so many um, various takes on the scripture, so many different doctrines that arose between denominations, and how can anyone know which one is true and faithful? What is the true teaching on baptism? What is the true teaching on the Lord's table? Because if you check out ten churches, uh, it's very likely you'll you'll hear ten different things. What what about salvation? Is it accepting Christ, walking down an aisle, being baptized? Do you have to do all three, or is it something else? And again. Check out a hundred churches. You may hear uh, all kinds of variations on that teaching. You see, one of the reasons God ended the church age when he did was it was time to save a great multitude of his people. He saved a good number, a handful of million perhaps, during the 1955 years of the church age. After saving just a relatively few in the Old Testament. We don't know how many, but let's a few hundred thousand perhaps in, or a million in all the Old Testament history. You, you see, God um, was concerned, of course, for all of his elect, but now comes the time in the end of the world, a time when maybe 90%, 95% of all who had their names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life will be alive on the earth because God arranged for the population of the world to explode at the same time of the end. And so he would save them. But the, the problem with the churches was this mass confusion. Where is truth? If, if he sends forth the gospel using the churches and congregations, once more, as he used them for the the uh, first fruits and, and the pouring out of the early rain, well, he has this tens and tens of millions of elect, and if they're directed to the church, uh, they'll be directed to various churches. They may go into the Catholic Church uh, in Ethiopia. They may go into the Ethiopian Church, which is very similar to the Catholic in South America, they, they would go into the Catholic, or perhaps they'll go into the Pentecostal churches that become other Gospels. There's even other religions, really, that are associated with the true Gospel, like Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Mormons, and, and so forth. It became chaotic and a mess. And so God, for the safety of his people... For the benefit of the great multitude, ended the church age and ended all that confusion. And, and, and what did he do? He raised up a ministry like Family Radio and Mr. Camping, who he equipped with uh, wisdom and understanding and, and made available to put in just thousands and thousands of hours of time of Bible study, and, and God opened the scriptures at that same time to reveal a pure form of the gospel, pure doctrines like the faith of Christ is how God saves uh, the end of the church age, the doctrine of annihilation over against the former teaching of an eternal damnation for sinners. 
the doctrine of Christ dying for sins at the foundation of the world. Doctrine after doctrine, a better understanding of the scriptures, a better understanding that there were wheat and tares growing in the congregations, that not everybody who said they were a Christian were a true Christian. You know, that kind of understanding we, we take for granted now, but go back into the 1980s and, oh no, you didn't bring up that kind of thing. If, if anyone said they were a Christian, they were a Christian. And, and so God purified his word and sent it forth outside of the churches, and they became saved through the hearing of the word of God, and they were directed to go nowhere. They were not directed to go to any church. As a matter of fact, they were told, don't go to church because the church age is over. You see how God protected them in that in multiple ways. Well, you, you see, once now... Um, we can know, and because God hasn't resumed the church age, that's definite. The church age is over, and and here's what God did in um, Ezekiel chapter 34, where God says in verse 2, Son of man prophesies against the shepherds of Israel, prophesies and saying to them, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah unto the shepherds, and the shepherds would be the same as the ministers. Well be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, shall not the shepherds feed the flock. And then he says to the shepherds in verse 9, Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of Jehovah. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. God has ended the church age, and in ending the church age, he removed all authority from popes, if they ever had any, and bishops, and pastors, and priests, and elders, and deacons, and anybody else who claims any kind of spiritual title in connection with the church. None of them, not a one in all the world today has official sanction from God to share the word of God, to bring the Bible to anyone. God ended his relationship. He ended the ministry of the churches, which means that God's people, we can know I'm not to listen to any pastor, any any elder, or anyone who is a church authority, and you you just uh, uh, now your question is well well how do we know who to listen to what minister? Well, you just eliminated 99.9 percent of all of them out there that would not be true ministers in any way. You see that makes it much much easier much much easier and then of course with the few remaining that are outside of the churches how many are outside of the churches well you might say well there are some on family radio outside of the churches but family radio now is uh, rekindling ties with those in the churches they're having pastors and so forth teach on their airwaves, which means, well, no, God doesn't want them to teach, and family radio is, is therefore going against the will of God in that matter. And if they're open to that, that tells me there's a problem with anyone who might be at family radio who perhaps himself does not go to church, yet... Uh, there, there's a problem there, so I, I don't, I'm going to be very skeptical of anything I hear there. As a matter of fact, as far as E-Bible Fellowship is concerned, we will not direct anyone to the Ministry of Family Radio. And how many others does that leave? There, there's BMI, there's E-Bible Fellowship, and yes, there's a bunch of individuals 
a bunch of individuals that were formerly associated through listening to family radio or, or even to e-bible fellowship but but you see many of these people you can discern because they're not listening to the bible they're they're not open to checking things out to searching the scriptures they they just simply uh, will will say, well, I don't listen to E-Bible Fellowship. I, I don't listen to these things about no more salvation uh, concerning spiritual judgments. And yet those are no more a, a shut door of heaven is what the Bible teaches. I, I didn't make that up. You know, you can read in Luke 13, when once the master of, of the house has shut to the door, God shuts the door. And, and he does that in the day of judgment. And, and, and so with these handful of others, just make sure, are they adding to the word of God? Are they subtracting? If they are, I'm not going to listen to them. Are they dismissive of the things the Bible's teaching and, and maybe give lip service, but they do not put into practice comparison of Scripture with Scripture and or are they careless? There are all kinds of people that are very careless, especially with date setting in in this time. Uh, they they uh, will just put forth a date, um, tying uh, five, six, seven, eight, ten things together that don't tie together, and they'll say, "Now uh, this is the date," and then that goes, and this is the date, and this is the date, and yes, uh, e Bible has put forth a date, but we put forth very strong scriptural support for the date of October 7th, 2015. We were incorrect, so we corrected it. We're wrong. And and now we're still open to that, but a date is a doctrine. It's a doctrine like elections, a doctrine like, um, uh, <laughs> can't think of a doctrine, like any, anything that is taught in the Bible is a doctrine, and and a date is a doctrine. It must be harmonized. It must fit with everything else the Bible says. It must have biblical support. It must be sound doctrine. It, it is not biblical. It's not faithful to just simply put forth a date. Oh, oh, yes, I'm a faithful believer because we know God will um, uh, will show uh, uh, end time information to his people regarding time and judgment and therefore I throw a date out there. No, no, you have one part right. God will open the scriptures to the understanding of his people regarding time and judgment but you were careless on the other part and and you gave reason to the enemies of God to blaspheme because you were so careless in the way you presented that date. Uh, I do not want people or or would permit anyone to post a date on my page uh, on Facebook for instance especially when you see so much carelessness regarding it. We have to be very sound in everything we teach and and the Bible has to prove it and and so that's what you look for. You look for someone lifting up the Word of God, the Bible, exalting the Word of God above all in subjection to the Word of God. That's the characteristic of God's elect. We submit because God directs us to. He, he by His grace, leads us and causes us to submit to the things the Bible says. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now we're going to go to our next caller. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Can you read and explain um, Leviticus 10, uh, 17 to 20? Leviticus 10... Let me start reading in verse 16. And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. 
He was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive, saying, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy, and God has given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Jehovah? Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place, as I commanded. And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before Jehovah, and such things have befallen me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of Jehovah? And when Moses heard that, he was content. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've never studied this. Uh, we know what Aaron's referring to is the death of his two sons uh, earlier in the chapter, Nadab and Abihu. They were messing around with strange fire. Um, that is, um, I'll, I'll read verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before Jehovah, which he commanded them not. You may wonder, well, what is strange fire? And the answer is that which God commands not. That is, God gave commandment regarding his uh, sacrificial system, burn offerings, meat offerings, all kinds of offerings, were commanded, uh, they, they were uh, specified, uh, God gave details, here's what you're to do, how you're to offer this sacrifice or perform this uh, ceremonial law, and Nadab and Abihu did not do it according to the commandment of God. Uh, and so God struck them dead and that's an illustration, it's a warning to those that would um, teach or, or bring other kinds of gospels, other erroneous doctrines that are not according to what the Bible teaches. And, and that was a warning uh, to Israel and to all the leaders in the church and to anyone who takes the word of God into their mouth be very careful when when you're involved in um, anything to do with the Bible to do so according to what God has spoken according to his commandment and and so Aaron is saying since his two sons were killed and his his other two sons uh, they they apparently did not carry out a task that they were supposed to carry out in a way that they should have. It seems though they they drew back from it, perhaps fearful, uh, pe perhaps very fearful, because their two brothers were just slain uh, for for not uh, being perfect, really. Um, you know. Uh, God commands, be therefore perfect as, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And failure uh, to keep God's commandment perfectly leads to death. The wages of sin is death. That's one transgression of one law of God. It, it's not just those men had to be perfect. All human beings were obligated every one of us to be perfect before God and and when we sin in one point we're guilty of all and and because we've transgressed the law we die we die we the wages of sin is death and and so Aaron is perhaps saying here when he said unto Moses behold this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before Jehovah, and such things have befallen me, that is, his, the death of his other two sons, and if I had eaten the sin offering today, 
should have been accepted in the sight of Jehovah. And when Moses heard that, he was content. So I, I'm not exactly sure, but I think we we can at least gather that it has to do with with some fear of violating the law of God, like like a newfound uh, fear that that the priest under Aaron, his sons, were experiencing when when God um, brought that judgment on the others to pass. No, that's, that helps because I didn't see that the praise befallen me referred back to verse 1, so that, that helps a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Okay. Um, can you uh, take a look at Daniel 2.49? Daniel chapter 2, verse 49 says, Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Okay, and Genesis 19, 1. Genesis 19, 1 says, and there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Okay, uh, I, I would like to know, what is the spiritual uh, meaning of sitting on the gate? Well, um, yeah, that's that's a good question. The gate uh, is a door. It, it would be a gate to a city. That's where Lot was seated. He was at the gate of Sodom. Daniel sat in the gate of the king, and that would be the gate in the city of Babylon. And there must have been a, a particular gate that the king uh, himself maybe would go to sit at, like we, we also see with King David at a time of battle. He would sit at a gate, and runners coming back with reports of the battle would come to the gate and the king would be there to receive the news. So perhaps there was a gate in Babylon. Maybe it was customary in ancient cities where where uh, a king would sit to receive those kinds of reports or, or maybe any sort of special uh, official business taking place. It could take place at the gate. Yeah, I, I know that the Rogers is a door. I thought that I was trying to see, see if that would fit somehow. Uh, that would help to explain the uh, that uh, issue about the gate. Uh, but anyway, I have another question. Who are Darius and Cyrus in Daniel 6.28? Yeah. They seem uh, okay. to be two well, individuals. Well, look at that. Let me just say one more thing about the gate. Okay. The, the gate of Sodom would be very similar to the gate of Babylon because Sodom was a very wicked city, Babylon, a very wicked city within a, the, the wicked nation. And, and if it's the king of Babylon's gate, the king of Babylon typifies Satan. And we wonder, well, what's Daniel, certainly a true elect child of God, doing sitting at the gate? And what's Lot doing sitting at the gate of Sodom? It's because... The, the gate does identify with the door, and here in both these places, uh, Babylon and Sodom, it's the door of an evil city, and, and those evil cities typify the world, and, and Sodom can also typify the church, Babylon typifying the world and the gateway between heaven and earth, and this earth is a wicked world ruled over for most of its history by Satan, the, the doorway or the gate between heaven and earth has been the word of God, the Bible. And, and so Lot and Daniel, being elect, are sitting at the gate to picture and represent God's people 
all through the history of the world that watch at the Bible to see what God will say to them. And we do find in Genesis 19 that God came to visit that wicked city and, and he met Lot at the gate. And that would be like God coming in judgment um, with the great tribulation and the judgment which was a judgment on the church and also the judgment on the world and God's people watching at the Bible, meeting him there and, and gaining understanding of what God was about to do to those wicked places. Now, okay, you also mentioned Cyrus in Daniel 6. Yes. Daniel, in Daniel 6, 6, verse 28. Yeah. Um, it says, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And we might think, well, this is two different kings, uh, two different men, but the uh, word and, the conjunction, can be translated even, even. And if you translate as even, it, it, it makes all the difference. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, even in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Wow. Not two men, you know, one plus another, but uh, he's called Darius and he's called Cyrus. So, so, so it's person. actually joining... Uh, or God is uh, saying that that Darius is Cyrus in this verse. Oh, okay. W one more question, please. Uh, in Daniel 9:24, uh, that seemed to be the, talking about the beginning of uh, May 21st, 2011. Daniel 9:24. Can you take a look at that, please? Daniel 9, verse 24. Yeah. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The, the 77, as the word weeks is the word seven, the 77s of Daniel chapter 9. Mr. Camping wrote an excellent little book with that title, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, and I think he gave uh, explanation for uh, the, their time pass. And, and you know, when uh, people charge the Lord's people, God's elect, and they say, oh, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't be uh, involved with time pass. Time pass, or looking for a timeline in the coming of Christ, it's the one taboo that's in the Christian church world. You, you can do anything else under the sun, and all men are, are doing whatever is right in their own eyes in church after church after church, and, and everyone's a brother, everyone's a sister. Oh, but a date setter, a date setter. You see, they're unified in one point, and it's very curious that they are, but the corporate church is unified on the single point and nothing else that no man knows a day or hour. And of course, unity amongst an apostate and, and evil congregation, uh, as we have it at the time of the end of the world, should not give anyone any kind of security. It should not give anyone any comfort. Oh, no, it must be because all churches say it. Well, Actually, it should stand out like a red flag that churches agree upon nothing, nothing, no matter what teaching, no matter what doctrine, and yet they all agree on this. How can they have such, such uniformity of agreement with this one teaching? And it's not for any good reason. It's because God has given them up, and in their blindness, they desperately want the world to continue on. They, they want their lives to continue on, just like any unsafe person in the world. And so they latch on to those verses that say, no man knows a day or hour. And, and, and they say, you're, you're not permitted 
to make a time pass. And yet when we read the Bible, we find God again and again and again is a God of time pass. He, he told Abraham, 400 years, and, and then um, I'll bring you again to this land. He, he told Noah. First he told him 120 years, then he said, yet seven days. It's a time path. He told Jonah, go into Nineveh and say, yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. A time path, a beginning point, a concluding point. And he told Daniel in visions, there are 70 weeks determined upon thy people. And they were time paths that can be shown to point to the first coming of Christ from starting points that, that I can't recall at the moment. Uh, again, I'd refer you to Mr. Camping's uh, The 70 Weeks of Daniel Chapter 9 booklet, and he lays it all out. We, we might think, well, this relates somehow to our time of the end, but uh, I've looked at it and looked at it, and I don't see how it relates to anything but the first coming of Christ and and it does, it points to uh, the, the time path goes right to the cross in 33 AD and, and, and it proves God gives time pass. Uh, it's not unbiblical to do so because God is under his own law. If it was unbiblical for his people to delve into time pass, it would be unbiblical for God to do so because he cannot say, well, one thing is right for me and another is not for my people. He's under his own law. And, and so God um, gives time pass, and he gave time pass very specifically that point to the date of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ here in Daniel chapter 9. And Old Testament saints could have known it and, and could have had understanding of the first coming of the Messiah based on what's written here. And it's interesting, in the New Testament Gospel accounts, we find, um, I think it was Simeon, who it was revealed to him he should not die, but he would see the Messiah. And Anna, the prophetess, who had understanding that the Messiah would come. And, and how did these people get that kind of understanding? Well, it's possible. There could have been God's elect at that time, and and God could have opened up understanding to them of Daniel's 70 weeks. And, of course, God also, um, well, well, we'll just leave it at that, that, that God is a God of time pass. And he's given some, of course, that direct us to May 21, 2011, that direct us to the end of the world. And, and we are within our privilege and right that God grants his people. If the Lord reveals these things, they belong to the people of God. But thank you, thank you very for much. calling and sharing. And let's go to our next caller, and this will be our last caller this afternoon. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, I just wanted to know: Are we allowed to download your your programs that you have on Vimo and upload them up to other social media sites? Well, uh, yes, yes, I think so. I'm I'm only uh, hesitating for a moment because there there could be some people who who misuse that. I'm not saying that you would be one of them. I know many people would not, but there, there's always some out there. But we at eBible Fellowship, we, we just want to get the Word of God out to as many people as we can. And so, yes, you're, uh, you're welcome to um, put it on your own Facebook or Twitter or, or uh, something like that. As long as you don't make any changes uh, to the teaching. Okay, and can, can we just attribute it to eBible Fellowship, you know, and, and just send them to your main website, or? Uh, yes, you, or, or to um, 
uh, we we have a lot of different ways of outreach. You could you could direct them to any one of them. You could direct them to Vimeo, E Bible Fellowship on Vimeo, or to uh, YouTube. Some of those videos are now being uploaded to YouTube or Facebook. We have several Facebook pages or to um, the website ebiblefellowship.com. All right, that's all I wanted to ask. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for calling and asking that question. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and, and for bringing up the questions and comments that you did, and especially the Bible verses that we had an opportunity to read and consider. But we've come to the end of our time at this point. You're welcome to stay with our online fellowship for more scripture reading or, or hymn singing. As songs will, uh, will be uh, played. Uh, or you can join us tonight or throughout the day on Facebook in our Sunday open Q&A group. And are welcome there. You can post a question at any time or share a comment. And, and I'll try to respond there, Lord willing, later this evening. But for now, may you have a good afternoon, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights following the Monday through Friday studies. Check ebiblefellowship.com for the current schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.